students, we're ready to begin if you are. Uh, this morning, we have the distinct pleasure of having with us a very stimulating person to speak to us from the University of Utah, Dr. J.D. Williams. He's a professor of political science uh, at the university. He took his PhD at Harvard, has been at Stanford, and graduated from Salt Lake City Public School. So that's quite a distinction for us. Uh, he made a bid for the Senate this year and has been an active member of his political party. He's a Democrat, but don't let that bother you. In 1963, Dr. Williams uh, received the Monet Brith Award for contributions to human brotherhood. All right, we've been talking a little bit about this, so be very impressed. And the Utah Bar Association's Liberty Bell Award for contributions to a free society under law. Again, one of the issues that we'll be talking about. In 1965, he was appointed as the first director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah. And this in itself is quite a distinction. I think you'll find his ideas very stimulating. He is not only active himself, but encourages others to be active, which is just as important. All right, Dr. Williams, I'd like to turn the balance of the time over to you. Good morning, Cubs. I understand that you made pygmies out of the Titans recently, and I congratulate you on your prowess. And hope that this is going to be a tremendously exciting fall for you academically, athletically, and socially. I've been asked to come today to talk about some of the great challenging principles of a democratic society that make our kind of government so extraordinarily difficult to live. And I would like to begin with a kind of a quick survey of the status of liberty and the struggle for liberty around the world, uh, and then get down to the internal aspects of this problem. Oliver Wendell Holmes used a kind of a spooky phrase years ago to say what I would like to say at the opening of this address this morning. And he put it this way, that there, quote, is a brooding omnipresence in the sky, unquote. And I submit to you that there is indeed a brooding omnipresence in the sky in this era in which you now come into social and political awareness of things about you. Uh, the horror of the tanks coming into Prague, Czechoslovakia, and stuffing out uh, liberty that uh, was beginning to flower there even within the framework of a communist regime. Uh, the deep-seated issues that are involved in Vietnam, uh, whether you be Dove or Hawk, uh, still the tremendous concern of whether that group of people shall have the right uh, to choose a future uh, as they might see fit uh, without uh, aggression from the North uh, or men in the South that may not really be dedicated uh, to freedom of choice. We have just come through a horrible week in August in which a national political party in this country has, hold a, has had to hold uh, its national nominating convention with barbed wire around an amphitheater and troops in the street, if you will. Now, I submit to you that the events of the last few weeks, especially Prague and Chicago, demonstrate what a perilous thing we have in this simple little word of liberty or a free society. And yet, of course, this is not the only period in which there has been a brooding omnipresence in the sky or that kind of a jeopardy, if you will, to the liberty that men love. One would have to say that in 1775 there was that same kind of omnipresence. British garrisons were being strengthened in the colonies in this hemisphere, new arrivals of British troops uh, were seen in a number of the ports. New restraints were being imposed on the citizens of Boston. And on the 23rd of March at the Second Revolutionary Convention in the colony of Virginia, a farmer stood up and expressed his stand on the value choices that confronted free men of that generation. You'll know in a minute who spoke the words when you hear them. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains or slavery? He asked his fellow delegates in that revolutionary convention. Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, 
But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. As so declared Patrick Henry in terms of the value choices that seemed to him to be available at that point in time in our relationships with the mother country. But we live in a very different kind of a day from Patrick Henry. The weaponry of this day would be far beyond the imagination or the bad dreams of any of his contemporaries. You think of the destructive power of a nuclear weapon, of uh, the gases and the chemicals that have been developed for warfare. And we have 5,000 dead sheep around the Dugway Proving Ground to remind us. I have seen one bulletin board. I don't know who put it up. You may have observed it somewhere. Uh, it was a dead sheep, uh, legs upturned in the stiffness of death, and the sign on the bulletin board, it was really intended for humans. Now, the weaponry of Patrick Henry's day did not have implications for more than just the people, the soldiers on the battlefield. Now we're talking about the death-dealing destruction of atomic and nuclear power for countless civilians, 75,000 in Hiroshima. And adding to the seriousness of it all, the genetic destruction you see for those who would be born into subsequent generations and still there would be damaged genes from the nuclear holocaust. Now, if life, is, if life on so broad a scale is threatened, is liberty still so dear as to be worth the risk of nuclear holocaust? We have pulled away from any kind of a confrontation with the Soviets in the rape of Czechoslovakia, apparently in recognition of the fact we just can't cope with it, and Czechoslovakia is not worth the price of nuclear war. I hate to say that out loud, but that seems to be the position that we're taking. And one thus comes face to face with that ugly phrase. Uh, I guess it was in advice and consent of Alan Drury a few years ago, better read than dead, as he puts into the mouth of one of his characters in that book. But for the individual as an individual, is the issue really different from that confronting men in all ages? Uh, to the individual man, to the individual American citizen, to the neighbor uh, in Prague, if you will, uh, is Brezhnev's bomb any deadlier than Socrates' hemlock when he chose that rather than being ignoble to the whole tradition that he represented in Athens? Would that bomb be any more painful than Jesus' cross? Any more individually searing than the fire at Joan of Arc's feet? Any more decapitating the, than the executioner's blade which ended the life of Sir Thomas More? any more fatal than British muskets across a green at Lexington, and perhaps really any more frightening than a Japanese kamikaze plane coming directly at you at a cruiser uh, at some stage of World War II. In each instance, death or the fight for a free life was preferred to personal slavery, whatever the nature of the weaponry. Death is death, and slavery is slavery whether beneath the boot of a Sparta, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, the Inquisition, George III, Hitler, Stalin, Khrushchev, or a Brezhnev, a Mao Zedong, or whoever the tyrant may be of a current generation uh, or episode or period. The quantitative change wrought by the nuclear weapons and missilery has not really altered the dilemma for each individual is life so dear that it shall be preserved at the price of liberty? I submit to you that regardless of the change in weaponry, the value choice that faced Patrick Henry is still the value dilemma for us in this day and age. Now, at the danger of grossly oversimplifying the kinds of values that confront us, let me put on the scales here in front of you some of the major things that I think are involved in a communist system and some of the major things that I hope are involved on the democratic side of the scale. Uh, on the Russian side, for example, tanks in Prague and what they say about the right not to change your form of government. The Berlin Wall and what it says about the right not to leave your country when you've had a belly full. A controlled press. A single slate of candidates at election time. 
and cradle to the grave state control of your lives. Now those are some of the large things that uh, come out of the communist network as I look at it. That is not comprehensive and it may be one-sided, but those are some of the major things that haunt me as I look at the balance scale on the communist side. On our side, some pluses and minuses. 41% of our Negro people who live in abject poverty in this country, below $3,000 a year in annual income, 41%. As I said, a Democratic National Convention that had to meet in a kind of a police state atmosphere. Indians who have been relegated to reservations as if they were not a part of the human race. Japanese in World War II that were rounded up without trials and put into American concentration camps. Those are all on the negative side of the ledger. Just to remind you that we've got some problems in this country. And on the other side of the democratic ledger, the freedom to worship or not to worship. You know, the freedom to uh, prefer Millicent or the Albion Basin to sacrament meeting on a Sunday. To read without fear, to change this form of government, to get rid of the national conventions and move to a national primary if you can get enough votes in order to influence a Congress to start the constitutional amendment or the statute. Ample choices at election time. The word this morning as I drove to South High School is that we may have five parties on the ballot on the 10th of November this fall. And self-direction of one's life. Nobody to compel you that you shall go to a university, and when you get there, nobody to compel you that you shall major in this rather than that, and when you get through and get that college degree, nobody to compel you which job you shall take when you go up to the placement bureau and you have six or seven offers, you make the decision. Now those are some of the large things that emerge on the positive side of the ledger as I weigh communism against a kind of a democratic order in which we live. Now, you remember Bobby Burns' wish to see ourselves as others see us? Perhaps it would be fairer, rather than for someone raised in this kind of a democratic capitalist milieu, uh, it would be better to judge it through the eyes of foreigners who came from the other system and then looked at us afresh. And happily, we have the testimony of a Russian couple, Igor and Zina Sobin, who came to this country right after World War II. And for this moment and this time, they can be our Bobby Burns to see ourselves as others see us. Igor got a job in the Metropole Hotel in New York and one day stepped outside and was dumbfounded by a scene that he watched next door, a barber shop and a couple of men walking around in a lazy circle with sandwich boards on them that simply said, Joe's Barber Shop unfair to organized labor. And Igor's mind went back to a line in the 1936 Russian Constitution which, quote, guaranteed every man a job, unquote. And he watched this picket line going on, and for the first time in his life, he realized that it might be important for men to be able to refuse to work. One night, Igor and Zina went down to Union Square, New York's version of London's Hyde Park, free speech corner in which they listened to a number of speakers attacking our capitalist system and urging that we move to socialism. One vituperative speaker going after the President of the United States and his foreign policy. Perhaps there might even have been a Mormon missionary there and a vegetarian and so on and so forth. And as they listened to this angriest speaker, Zena said, well, why don't they arrest this man? And Igor, now beginning to understand a little bit more, a little bit more about the nature of the American system, said this, no, to allow him to speak in this fashion surely is a sign of strength. It would have been fine, you see, for Mayor Daley to have a little dose of that. Could we take just a touch of freedom of speech and a parade not in the vicinity of the amphitheater to let them speak what they wanted to say? What they wanted to do was fight. If he had allowed them to speak and to parade, then there might not have been any fight. But now back to the Sobens once more. They marshaled some savings after a couple of years of frugality and went into a bank, got a 15-year mortgage to buy a house, walked out, and Zena said to her husband, surely this lady who is selling the house to us, giving us 15 years to repay, is not worried about revolutions without long to pay off the mortgage, she said. And then finally, it was the husband who added the whole thing up to get, to get some overall picture of what this country was all about that they were now adopting. This is the way he put it. It meant that whatever happened to us, good or bad, would be our own responsibility. 
In the Soviet Union, the regime was responsible for everybody, and we had freedom to do only one thing, to help the regime. We didn't have to think what to do next. Our lives were planned for us, and we asked no questions. Still, it is a better freedom here, a more honest one, in which people can ask questions and have opinions. But what I ask you, my listeners, this morning to zero in on was his first sentence. We had come to understand that whatever happened to us would be our own responsibility. Now that was deep insight into the basic nature of a free society, and I shall come back to that quotation in just a moment. Now, to those of you this morning who want to cast your lot with the Sobans, who want to give up a kind of an easy cradle-to-the-grave security, no questions asked, and who take the insecurity of our system, or who want to line up with the Patrick Henrys and the Socrates who loved liberty above all else, I would dedicate the tapestry of this fabric of liberty this morning to you and that kind of a value choice. Now, my examination today will not be primarily on the foreign policy aspects of this brooding omnipresence and the fight for liberty, but rather something much more close to home. What does this kind of a system demand of us as citizens? What are these difficult principles that make democracy so tough a kind of a system to live? That will be the nature of my examination. And if time permits, although I know my speech teachers at Stanford used to say, concentrate on only one point and then sit down, if you can live with it and if I've got time, I want to try to take you through about six of these tough principles. I'm going to race through them right now and then we're going to take them one at a time. The right to be insecure. Freedom for the thought that we hate. The right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. Freedom means the right to preserve or to lose freedom. Freedom must mean freedom for all Americans, in short, equality. And finally, to preserve the Constitution in bad times as well as in good and easy times. Now, that's a map of where we're about to go. We start now as we put together the warp of the fabric of liberty, putting in this first thread now on the loom, freedom to be insecure. Igor and Zina Soben, with whom we've already visited, probably had a better understanding of Thomas Jefferson and a motto of his more than most Americans that I know. I don't know if you're in the mood for Latin this morning, but I think it sounds exciting in the Latin. Malapriculosum libertatum quam quietum servitudum. I much prefer perilous liberty to quiet servitude, Jefferson said. Why break away from the mother country? His answer, we are fighting for the right to be insecure. Why do you dislike the British king? His answer, I know the cows on my farm at Monticello. Feed and inbreed and pamper any group of animals, and in less than a generation, they become totally incapable of caring for themselves. That's why I hate the British king. I don't want to be pampered. I am fighting for the right to be insecure. A much more recent president by the name of Harry Truman put the same point in this fashion. Liberty does not make all men perfect, nor all society secure, but it has provided more solid progress and happiness and decency for more people than any other philosophy of government in our history. In short, our society does not promise security. As the Sobins understood, whatever happens to us will be our responsibility, and we're going to have to face the music. And yet I tell you, my good friends, that there is a painful search for security and a flight from freedom in this country. And I want to give you some examples. Eleven years ago, a small group of us decided to overthrow the government of Salt Lake City, uh, not with bombs and not with terror, but through the ballot to bring about what is called home rule and probably to get a city manager or at least a strong mayor system instead of a grossly inept and weak five-man commission form of government where the monkey chases his tail around the flagpole at city commission meetings. We wrote to the president of one of the largest women's clubs in town. Now, that's not composed of large women. It was a large club of women. 
And we asked her if perhaps her club would like to support the campaign for home rule. And she wrote back and said no. And her reason was, quote, it being such a controversial subject, I most certainly would be severely criticized, unquote. Let us stay away from controversy, she was saying. Don't rock the boat. About that same period of time, the University Extension Division was holding a discussion program, Great Decisions in Foreign Policy. One of the groups was going to be over in the adult evening school at West High School. And a lady called, and uh, she told me that her husband and she could only participate in things which were safe and legal. Now, I should have had the courage to tell her that while it was perfectly legal to talk about American foreign policy, it was not the least bit safe because somebody's eyes, someone's ideas were going to take a beating in the course of the next 10 weeks. But you know the huckster, he always wants to have more people come into the class and into the discussion group. And so I patently told her, oh, please come, it'll be safe and legal. And sure enough, in two weeks, that woman had destroyed that discussion group and it was abandoned because of her dictatorial attitude. Upon withdrawing, she put this epitaph on the grave of that discussion group, quote, no citizen was ever given a right to criticize the actions of a government official. I wish people would appreciate the need for caution in speaking and acting, she said. And that was American democracy, her version, 1957. Now I remind you in the language of Benjamin Franklin, those who would sacrifice a little liberty for temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. This is the right to be insecure. This is the right to have opinions. This is the right to criticize your government. As I shall say over and over again this morning, not the right to urge people to disobey the law, but every right to urge that the law be changed. And if you need a secure system in which people do not ask any questions and have no opinions, there are some countries around this world that probably would welcome you. Now to the second difficult principle of a democratic order, and I'll put it bluntly to you in Mr. Justice Holmes' phrase, freedom for the thought that we hate. Now, where does freedom really begin? In my judgment, it really begins in the heart of man, long before anything is ever said. It's a matter of feeling. It's a matter of belief. It's a matter of conviction. I don't know whether you were in the mood for Latin five minutes ago or whether you're now in the mood for poetry. Let me take you to my favorite American poetess, Miss Emily Dickinson. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door on her divine majority, obtrude no more. The notion that the human soul is beyond the reach of any majority, that in the private recesses of this temple, of your heart and your mind, you decide for yourself, should we be in or out of Vietnam? Uh, should it be Mr. Weileman or Mr. Hansen? Should we join that peace movement? Should we join that home rule campaign? Should we affiliate with the League of Women Voters or the Republican Party or the John Birch Society or what have you? And in the quietude of your heart, the courageous person makes up his mind. And on that, on that sovereignty, no majority is big enough to intrude. Now that's where freedom really begins. But for most people who cannot be recluses, as Miss Dickinson was in some facets of her life, freedom of opinion has then got to lead to freedom of expression because the pressure builds up in the steam uh, kettle or what have you and it has got to have a way out. You want to tell somebody, I'm going to vote for X, I'm going to send that letter to the Tribune, I've got to let off steam on how I feel about this. And as soon as we get to that point, then that means we're going to have diversity of opinion. We're going to have differing ideas. And the key thing that I want you to understand about this second aspect of American democracy is not the motto of this country the way you may have learned it. United we stand, and divided we would fall. The genius of America is the reverse of it. In matters of opinion, divided we stand, and united we would fall. There's a fancy word in political science to describe that motto, the word pluralism, that out of diversity comes strength not the monolith of the Berlin Wall in its uniformity, that the communist hope will give its society strength, but rather the diversity of every block of the American pluralistic wall, every individual with his right to be different 
And out of that diversity and out of that freedom, we assume that the whole society takes on strength. Now, to the painful part of this, the diversity of opinion means that we're going to be confronted as we go along in life with all kinds of bad ideas, sometimes enormously bad ideas. Now, for example, uh, I'll give you my examples and you'd have your own. People who say we ought to get out of the United Nations, people who say that Dwight Eisenhower is a communist, people who are afraid of fluoridating the water supply because they think it's a communist conspiracy to destroy the brain cells, stop all kinds of food shipments to Poland, uh, break off diplomatic relations with this or with that country, don't engage in diplomatic relations with Red China, uh, a whole host of ideas that for me would be bad ideas and someone far more conservative than I would tick off a number that he would regard as bad. Now, how shall we develop a philosophy about those ideas? Well, let me take you back to a case of the Supreme Court, and I'm going to expose you to a few of them this morning, of a lady who for some people brought to this country some very bad ideas. Her name was Rosica Schwimmer. Now, she didn't swim across the Atlantic Ocean. She came in the normal fashion. She walked. No, I mean, she came by boat, I mean. And uh, she was a pacifist, a, not a Quaker, a philosophical pacifist, but who would agree with a Quaker or Seventh-day Adventist pacifistic philosophy, not to bear arms? When she got to the immigration authorities, five years after coming here to take an oath as a citizen, they asked her, will you swear to bear arms in defense of the Constitution? Now, fat chance that this 65-year-old lady was ever going to be called up in the draft. But uh, Ms. Schwimmer said, no, I am a pacifist and I will not swear to bear arms. And they denied her her citizenship, denied her her application. But the Constitution permits aliens to get into our courts, and she got all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court sustained the immigration authorities in denying Rosica Schwimmer her application for citizenship. But you know something? Today we've forgotten about the majority opinion and all we remember is Oliver Wendell Holmes' dissenting opinion. And in it he said this, if there is any principle of the Constitution which more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not just free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Now, we drop down 10 years later and we encounter another, quote, bad idea, unquote. A group of people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, who do teach their children not to salute the flag. On the grounds of a literal reading of the 20th chapter of Exodus, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And to salute the American flag, which we don't happen to have this morning, is to uh, pay obeisance to a mortal god, and that is a sacrilege to your immortal god. And in the 1930s, school boards began to expel Jehovah's Witness children who would not salute the flag. They never take these matters lying down, and their parents took the states, the school boards, to court, got to the Supreme Court of the United States, and in a case whose title I've always loved, Minersville School District versus Gabitis, the Supreme Court of the United States said the school board acted constitutionally. A part of the job of American education is to teach patriotism and to get patriotism out of the kids. They we're going to get it out of the kids. Well, then. Two justices died or retired, and Mr. Justice Murphy and Mr. Justice Rutledge came onto the court, and back up the Jehovah Witnesses come after a new expulsion from school. West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. And now the vote had changed, and in one of the loveliest and the most powerful opinions you would ever read in the Barnett case, Mr. Justice Jackson says this, in the tradition of Holmes. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, may declare what shall be orthodox in politics, in nationalism, or in religion, and it does not speak well for our free institutions ever to require an expression of belief therein. Freedom of religion comes first, and a compulsory saluting of the flag comes way down the list. We shall, we shall respect the right of those kids to be different, and if they are committing a sacrilege to their immortal God by saluting the American flag, the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution put liberty and freedom of religion at the very top of our value system, and we shall not compel them to salute the flag. Now, I 
tell some groups about that decision, and I'll get some ladies who will stand up and say if they want to salute the flag, then back to the Soviet Union. And I think about e pluribus unum, and out of the many one, that divided we stand and united we would fall. And I'm glad about Barnett and about Jackson and about Oliver Wendell Holmes and about the First Amendment and about the word liberty and due process of law. Now, we still are faced with the bad ideas. I've given you the constitutional doctrines that they have a right to be expressed. But for you as a citizen, offended by a democratic liberal, you as a citizen, offended by a Birch Society spokesman who will come here one day and address you, how shall we cope with bad ideas? Well, the very first thing, I think, is to understand their importance. John Stuart Mill, a hundred years ago, told us in lasting terms of the importance of bad ideas. You engage in censorship, the idea that you may decide to censor, let's say it's Galileo's, quote, bad idea, unquote, may just happen to be what? You answer me. Out loud may just happen to be the truth. Was that the case with Galileo and the Inquisition? Or aren't you good enough historians yet? The answer to my question is yes. He had the right scientific idea and it was stamped out for a while. Or the idea that you stamp out may be partially true and if allowed to come forth would enlarge our hold on truth. But the important argument of Mill was the third one. Plain and simply an argument for bad ideas to circulate. Because when you hear a bad idea, it may force you really to examine why you hold on to the ideas you hold on to. And if never challenged, your beliefs become the sterile, petrified wood of an unchallenged mind. You believe in God? You've never had a teacher yet, like my Quaker history professor at Stanford, who said to me one day when I asked a naive question about Moses in a class in Western civilization, Mr. Williams, whoever said there was a Moses? And it shattered me for three months. And I came back from that summer quarter at Stanford, and in what should have been a playtime for six weeks, I went to an institute of religion and did my level best to find out, really, is there reason to believe there ever was a Moses? And I was a stronger man for that examination. Now, Mill says we ought to have the freedom for bad ideas to circulate in order to strengthen people and force them to examine their own ideas. Now, let me put it to you in terms of a story. The story belongs to our greatest historian, living historian, uh, historian, Sir Arnold Toynbee. He tells about British fishermen going out into the North Sea and getting their holds filled with perch, then making the long sea journey back to England, and the perch have lost all their vitality and are almost worthless in the fish markets of London when they get back. Then some genius in the British fishing fleet gets an idea, drop a few of the natural enemy of the perch down into the hold, some catfish. All of the way back, catfish chase perch around the holds. Unfortunately, a few perch end up in catfish gullets, but the rest of them are just as vigorous as their brothers in briny deep. Bad ideas are the catfish of a free society to keep us perch going, thinking, stimulated and therefore intellectually and hopefully spiritually alive. That's why we need bad ideas and freedom for them. How shall we counteract bad ideas then? Not by censorship. Not by what a group of people called Students for a Democratic Society who really ought to be SFS, Students for a Fascist Society, are doing. Booing, walking out, chanting, preventing speakers like Orville Freedom, Freeman, uh, Secretary McNamara, Rusk, uh, Ambassador Goldberg from finishing speeches at Wisconsin, at Dartmouth, at Harvard, at Brown, at Yale, at Berkeley, and at my alma mater at Stanford where they beat on the doors of Vice President Humphrey's car. Those people don't believe in freedom. Only freedom for their ideas and not a word for anybody else. Now I beseech you, as you grow and develop and you get deep-seated political philosophies and these other ideas come along, uh, that make you mad, commit yourself this morning, I shall not counteract bad ideas by that kind of censorship or intimidation, but rather the rebuttal power of the better ideas, that you shall ask for the platform, you shall ask for equal time, 
You'll get out a mailing list somehow for that speaker from the John Birch Society who comes along to say that the United Nations is communist dominated and we ought to get out. For you to offer equal, demand equal time to say, if we're going to stop being Pax Americana and involved unilaterally in Vietnams all around the world, we've only got one place to go, and that is a world police force under United Nations auspices, and you convince an audience there is another way. Now, I ask you to think of the compelling power of better ideas. Here is John Milton, Areopagitica, 17th century. Though all the winds of doctrine were loosed upon the earth, if truth be in the field, we do unwisely by misdoubting her strength to license and censure her. Let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Now that is the marketplace of good and bad ideas wrestling with each other and the democratic faith, small d now, the democratic faith is that most of the time good ideas will be able to triumph over bad ideas. Now that is a very long discussion really about the second point I wanted to make. A democratic society demands freedom of expression and that has got to include freedom for the thought that we hate. Now proposition number three as we put this thread into the warp of the fabric of liberty. Your right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. What that is saying is that your liberty is circumscribed by the liberty of everybody else. It is not absolute, it is a relative thing. Your right to buy a house eight years from now when you get married, let's say, does not include the right to deny a Negro to buy the house next door, or Japanese, or Spanish-American, or what have you. Your right to buy a house does not include the right to deny another person with a purchasing power to come in and buy the house next door. Your right to swing your fist ends where his nose begins. In the area of opinion, which we've talked about, I add these additional things illustrating this third principle about the relativity of our right. In this country, opinions are essentially unlimited. There, are, no, there is no restriction. Advocacy is essentially unlimited, except in the area of advocacy to violate the law, and that can be punished. Fighting words may be punished, the Supreme Court has said. And that, I'm sure, is where the demonstrators in Chicago a couple of weeks ago invited disaster because of the horrid things I know that they were saying to policemen. That is not meant to be a balanced evaluation of what happened, but just to indicate there is a limit to what can be said. And our actions, obviously, may be severely limited by the rights of others. In housing, your right to use weapons for certain criminal purposes your right to destroy another person's reputation by libeling or slandering him. These get over into the area of actions, if you will, and they may be limited. Opinions essentially unlimited. Advocacy, if it is aimed at changing laws, almost unlimited. Advocacy to violate the law, strictly limited. And actions themselves, where they may trample on the rights of others, may be severely limited. Now that's what I mean by the right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. The relativity of our rights. Proposition number four in the fabric of liberty. I think a spooky one. Freedom means the right to preserve or to lose your freedom. A free society can abolish itself by direct action, by lethargy, by indifference, by letting dominating groups come in and take over. A free society can bag it. And the Sobans understood that whatever happens to us will be our own responsibility. Now, my good friends, I want to tell you that there are threats on all side to American democracy and freedom. Clearly, there is the external threat of communism. The demonstration in the last couple of weeks in Prague is evidence of the fact that the Soviets hate freedom and that they have the military power to quash it in some places in this world. They remain a great part of the brooding omnipresence in the sky. Inside this country, we have internal dangers, again from communists, taking advantage of racial riots and racial disturbances. 
and also from what is called the new left, at least from the version of it that I refer to, students from a democratic society who do not believe in freedom at all in my judgment. We also are endangered in my judgment from right-wing extremists, white citizens councils devoted to white supremacy and further stepping on the neck of Negro citizens. In my judgment, the Birchers are not committed to freedom. From super patriotic groups who imply that if you're not with them, you must be on ambush trail, to use a Cleon Skousen phrase. You must be against us, they say. So I tell you that in this generation, as with Abraham Lincoln's, we are constantly engaged in a war testing whether this kind of a society can long endure, if I may paraphrase the Gettysburg Address. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is secure, including freedom itself. All right, now what do we do? To deal with this fourth aspect of a free society, we've got to zero in on the individual citizen and his capability of making a change. Now, yesterday I was invited to the Granite School Board office, five of us, to take on the county library director, Mrs. Ruth Vine Tyler, who will not move a library up east of Wasatch Boulevard where something like 9,000 of us live. And as Shakespeare put into the hand, into the mouth of uh, Casca and Brutus, getting ready to kill Julius Caesar, Casca shall free Casca. In my own hands I hold the power to end my own captivity. And you know what he was referring to, a dagger. Now what I want to say to you here is that in your hands, either individually or collectively, you can, in, you, you can influence government, you can change things. I tell you this story although the time races on here and I apologize. Last March, we go through the annual thaw. Winter beginning to give way, but we get a, a thaw and water on the streets, the next night of freezing, and then uh, the streets begin to break up. You're in a carpool. Uh, you drive to work or to school, you hit a chuck hole, and blue profanity fills the car. The driver raises his voice, when are they gonna fix these streets? Or he might inflect it, when are they going to fix these streets? Or, when are they going to fix these streets? But almost never will he inflect it. When are, they, when are they going to fix these streets? Because now the person on the front seat beside him feels that he's supposed to answer. Who's they? I guess it's the street department. I suppose they don't because we're not willing to pay enough taxes. And then all of a sudden, one of you in the conversation gets the point. Then in a democracy, the question has really got to be, when are we going to fix the streets? As Dick Poston put it in the title of a great book a few years ago, just this simple little truth, democracy is you. Democracy is you. Now, as Amy Semple McPherson used to put on a church of hers in Los Angeles, come in and have your faith lifted. Now, let me lift your faith in regard to what individuals can do in American politics. After the Hungarian revolt, like the Czechoslovakian revolt, we had a flood of Hungarian refugees to this country. One of them got to Salt Lake City. He became a painter for the Granite School Board. He smoked, and he was fired by the Granite School Board for violating an unknown ordinance that Granite School employees shall not smoke on or off the school grounds. And this Hungarian painter was dismissed. The next night of the school board meeting, the board members couldn't get into their tiny old offices on State Street. There were so many citizens there. You talk about Vox Populi, you should hear Vox Populi talk. And that night, that ordinance came out of the school board because enough irate citizens cared enough to protest. I think of Dr. David Smith going to a PTA meeting with me in uh, a neighborhood where both of us used to live at the Dilworth School. And his being shocked to find out that there were not enough books in his son's fourth grade room to go around. Now, a lot of citizens would say, oh, what the hell, you know, I guess there isn't anything I can do about it. Not Dave Smith. The next morning, he picks up the telephone. He calls the Salt Lake City Board of Education. Young lady, I would like to know why there aren't enough, uh, no, I would like to know why you people are discriminating against the citizens east of uh, 21st East. Sir, what did you say? I want to know why you people are discriminating against the people east of 21st East. Sir, would you calm down and really tell me the problem? There aren't enough school books in the Dilworth School. And you know something? Four days later, the books arrived. One telephone call one telephone call. If you were now to come out to my new neighborhood, you'd see tennis courts on the grounds of the Churchill Junior High School. Six of us organized, got help, 
got a partnership between the County Recreation Department, the Granite School Board, and the neighborhood. Shared the cost of it, a third each. And there are now tennis courts there because six citizens knew they had the power to do it. Now I submit to you that part of the responsibility of this free society is to preserve freedom and it lies in your hands like Casca. In my own hand I hold the power to end my captivity or to preserve my freedom. And fulfilling that promise of American democracy is going to require that you get into politics. And in case nobody else tells you in the next six weeks, the men running for the House, the men running for the Senate, Mr. Nixon and Mr. Humphrey, I hate to mention his name, but George Wallace, all of those campaigns need your help. And you've got some time after school to call those volunteer headquarters and say, I'm ready to distribute literature. And you can have your first introduction to politics in this presidential election year. Ella Hugh Root, a great Republican, put it this way years ago. Politics is the practical exercise of self-government. And if we are to have self-government, somebody has got to go into politics. The principal ground of reproach against any American citizen should be that he is not a politician. Now, I beg of you, in this year of 1968, a presidential election year, go into politics. You are not too young. Now we're to the next to the last point, so we're approaching the end. The fifth thread that I would put into the fabric of liberty, if I've counted them right, is that freedom, if any of us are to enjoy it, must include freedom for all. If freedom is going to be good for any American citizen, it has got to be good for all. Let me quote Teddy Roosevelt. We believe that this country will not be a permanently good place for any of us to live in unless we make it a reasonably good place for all of us to live in. Our cause is the cause of justice for all in the interest of all. Unquote. Now because of our failure to live that, we are now in grave difficulty in this country. I recited one statistic to you about the plight of the Negro people. I could take you until noon with the statistics to mark off the problem that they face. 7,000 of them in Utah, 10,000 Indians, 30,000 Spanish Americans, and gross problems of discrimination that confront all of those people. And today we have riots in the streets. I could have cried a month and a half ago when I was in my old city of Washington, D.C. to go up and down 14th Street where my wife and I used to shop and go to movies. Store after store boarded up and burned out the victims of a guerrilla warfare that took place after the death of Martin Luther King. And I guess we could see some of the same remains in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Newark, and in Watts, among other places. We are now in the fourth revolution of our history. This revolution has been brought on because we never have been able to achieve Jefferson's algebra, the Declaration of Independence. The simplest equation you could possibly imagine. You'd be insulted if your algebra teacher gave it to you next period. One equals one. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. One shall equal one. And I tell you, in many areas of the basic aspects of life, our problem is now worse than it was in 1954, when by unanimous vote the Supreme Court held, for example, that school segregation was unconstitutional. Now more Negro children go to all Negro schools in this country than they did in 1954, but not as a result of law any longer, simply as a result of a new facet of the problem, you guess. I don't hear a guess. Housing discrimination and the de facto segregation of neighborhoods. We've gotten worse in that area. The gap between white family income and Negro family income is worse than it was 10 years ago. And any wonder that we have the civil rights revolution going on around us. I remind you then that the fifth thread in the fabric of liberty in one single word is the word equality. It's gotta be the same amount of freedom of opportunity for everybody if your street is to be secure, if your job is to be secure, if there is to be any kind of stability or security, that word again, in our communities, 
Nobody must be alienated away from the mainstream of American life. And to the final thread, I would call this one actually the woof thread in the fabric of liberty, the one that runs the other direction. The vertical thread that's got to hold these other five warp threads together if the fabric is to have any kind of integrity and permanence. In a word, that's the thread of the Constitution itself. That we are to be a government of laws and not of men. It is to be the foundation for all of these other liberties. And you've heard me refer to a few of its principles this morning, like the First and the Fourteenth Amendment, for example. Now, there is a natural tendency to take shortcuts with the Constitution in bad times. You want to deal with rapists, you want to deal with murderers, you want to deal with communists. Jeez, arrest them. As a man said to me coming from the Denver airport uh, to go into the heart of Denver the other day, as he started to talk about the Chicago riots and he was all on the side of Mayor Daley, heavens, the thing to do is simply to shoot them on the spot. See, no arrest, no right to counsel, no indictment, no trial by jury, no right to appeal, summary justice on the spot. Take shortcuts with the Constitution. And then, my friends, what have you got? The enemies of this country win. They wanted to destroy the Constitution. And the tragedy, if we follow that kind of argument, is that we have done their work for them. We have undermined the Constitution to deal with them, and in the process, we have become exactly like the people that we are trying to combat. Now, I beg of you to take this one to heart. The Constitution of the United States was intended for bad times as well as good. It does not leave us helpless or hapless in dealing with subversives. It still permits the Congress to make subversive acts like arson and espionage and sabotage crimes against this country, and we can deal with those problems. But let us not take shortcuts setting up congressional committees to be substitute for the courts, denying the right to counsel, breaking into the 15th floor of the Hilton Hotel without search warrants to club people on the head because we think they were dropping beer cans with urine on policemen. Let us not take shortcuts with the guarantees of the Constitution. Now, this morning, you've been patient with me. I've tried to suggest to you that liberty is a perilous thing all around the world. And I reminded you about Prague and Berlin and Vietnam. But the thrust of the, remark, or the remarks this morning has been that liberty is also a perilous thing inside this country. And that if you want to enjoy it now, later as adults, and for your kids to grow up in a free society, that there are at least six threads that we have got constantly to have on the loom as we keep this fabric of liberty mended and repaired year after year. May I say once more what they were? The right to be insecure, freedom for the thought that we hate, the right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins, that is the relativity of rights. Freedom means the right to preserve or to botch it, to lose your freedom. Freedom for you has got to be freedom for all Americans, in a word, equality. And that if we want freedom, then we must devote ourselves to preserving the American Constitution at bad times as well as good. Now, I end on the same note on which I began, the value choice for a Socrates, a Joan of Arc, a Jesus Christ, a George Washington, a Patrick Henry, a Thomas Jefferson, a citizen of this day and age, if you will. Shall we take the easy road out? Take a kind of an enforced security in which people shall not ask questions and not rock the boat? Or will you still, with Patrick Henry, opt for the insecurity of a free society? I end with one of the earliest and greatest voices for freedom, one of the greatest orators of them all, that great Athenian Demosthenes, of about the fourth or fifth century, I guess about the fourth century B.C. The greatness of Athens was now diminished. The Macedonians had come down and were conquering Greece. And they had chased this spiritual leader of the remaining Athenians, 
to a temple at Poseidon. The temple was a holy place and the soldiers would not enter in. But they sent in a message to Demosthenes that if he would come out, they would assure him of his life, but he would then be imprisoned in Macedonia, but would be able at least to remain alive. And this was his reply. I dread the clemency you offer more than the torture of death which I had reason to expect, for I cannot bear that it be reported that the king had corrupted me by the promise of life to desert the ranks of Greece and stand in those of Macedon. Glorious and beautiful I should have thought it if my life could have been guarded by my country, by the fleet, by the walls which I have built, by the treasury which I have filled, by her constitution uh, giving liberty to her people, by her ancestral glory, by her assemblies of free men, and by the love of my brother Athenians who so often have crowned me, by Greece, which hitherto I have been able to save. But since this may not be, since this temple, these altars, and sanctities cannot keep me from the court of the king of Macedon, a spectacle, a slave, I, Demosthenes, whom nature never formed for disgrace, I who have drunk in from Xenophon and Plato the hope of immortality, I for the honor of Athens prefer death to bondage and thus wrap myself in liberty, the fairest winding sheet. I think you'll agree with me, uh, we are all indebted to Dr. Williams for his time, we're appreciative, and I think you'll agree that uh, those of you who I met with yesterday, at any rate, uh, I wasn't fooling you, you were well rewarded, and you can see why uh, he is in such demand, not only at the university, but uh, elsewhere. Uh, he will be with us for a few more moments this morning. He has a plane to catch. He's a very busy man, and I think this uh, makes us all the more grateful for your presence here today. His thoughts were very stimulating to me personally. I hope to you. I hope served as a, an appropriate kickoff to the course of study we're about to embark upon. A number of you, uh, I am certain, have prepared some... Uh, questions you'd like to ask of, uh, of Dr. Williams, uh, probably more than we have time for. And uh, as I counseled you before we came down, uh, have courage. Uh, don't let the large group bother you. Uh, you will find, as you already have, I suppose, he's a man uh, well-versed in the world uh, and local, state, national, international level. So, for the few moments we have remaining, uh, and Dr. Williams must leave us at 5 after 10, uh, do we have any questions that you would like direct to direct to him? And it seems that we've covered such a broad spe spectrum that almost anything would be, within reason, would be appropriate. Uh, would you care to respond to that? All right, now have at me. Uh, and I agree, anything goes. All right, loud and clear now. Uh, I was horrified by what went on inside. Uh, the crowning, crushing blow for me was when uh, they permitted the nomination of Julian Bond and then would not permit seconding speeches. Under some kind of an excuse, we've gone through the alphabetical call of the states, uh, there's no time for seconding.